Today, for me, I'm a little stressed out. So uh, when I get a little stressed out, I feel like I got to pray. And uh, my wife was trying to minister to me today, and I was rejecting it. And uh, I was like, I know what I need to do. I don't need you to tell me. And uh, she said, uh, no, you need to listen to this right here. And uh, she was right, so I had to uh, get humbled today. So that's all right. Uh, ain't the first time, won't be the last. Amen? Amen. So let's pray against the spirit of hard-headedness, and then uh, we'll get into our message today. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for how you teach us and lead us and guide us. I thank you for how you minister to us from your word. I pray that the scriptures would be alive to us today, a blessing to us today, and um, it would help us to overcome the spirit of being hard-headed from time to time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, I want you to grab those uh, notes so you can follow along with me. We're in the middle of a class, 11 Ways God Speaks to Us in the Bible. And uh, last week we talked about the first way, which was through his... Okay, that's good. This is good. Word, right? Through his word, we talked about the word of God. You want to get a copy of those notes before you go. Um, talk to somebody else besides me and they'll get you one. And, um, but we're going to talk today about how God speaks to us through wisdom. Let's say that word wisdom together on three. One, two, three. Wisdom. wisdom. The Bible's got a lot to say about wisdom. And so we want to talk a little bit today about how this looks and uh, what the Word of God tells us about wisdom. So this is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 24. I've underlined some words. I want you to take note of those. Circle each one that's underlined as we get to it. Okay, it says, Blessed is the one who find wisdom and to the one who gets understanding. So that word blessed means happy. So it's actually a good thing for you when you find wisdom. It's a good thing for you when you find understanding. For the gain from her, now it's calling wisdom by the name of a woman, okay? So it's saying wisdom's like a woman that you got to chase after. Men, you should understand this, right? Go find that woman, and when you get her, this is what she's going to bring to you. Her gain is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She's more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Now, what that's saying is, if you would just get that grasping wisdom would be the most desirable thing, once you could get a hold of it, it would change your life. And now, what does she bring? Well, here's what she brings. Verse 16, long life is in her right hand, and riches and honor are in her left. So wisdom brings a long life full of riches and honor. Now, how many of you know this is a good thing, right? Wisdom paves the way to a long life full of riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and her paths are that of peace. Now, not only does it bring long life and riches and honor, it also gives you a pleasant life. That's an enjoyable life, a good life, and a peaceful life. How many of you want that? Yeah, that's what you want, right? She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth, and by understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open, and the clouds dropped down on the dew. Now, here's what it's saying. Wisdom, understanding, and the knowledge of God are the very foundations of this world. This is one of the most important principles you could understand. If you can get this one thing right, that we hear from God through his wisdom, it would really change things in how you live your life. My son, don't lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and an adornment for your neck. And you'll walk on your way securely. Your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you'll not be afraid. And when you do lie down, even your sleep will be sweet. Now, this is what the Bible has to say about wisdom. This is a good thing. Job 12, verses 12 and 13. Job heard this. Uh, he said this, Wisdom is with the aged and understanding in the length of days. With God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. Now, what this is saying is the older you get, the more wisdom you should have. The only problem is that's not necessarily true, is it? Everybody here knows at least one old fool, right? <laughs> get older and things don't change. You're supposed to get wiser with age because here's what you get with age, experience. And when you learn from your past and you learn from your mistakes, you like a fine wine, you age well, 
and you're more valuable because you got experience and wisdom. You know what you bring to the table. Check this out, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. Verse 8, the rulers of this age understood, they never understood this, because if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it's written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. We'll talk about this a little bit more in just a minute, but the idea here is that God's wisdom is not the same thing as the world's wisdom. God's wisdom is not always easy to understand or comprehend. God's wisdom doesn't always make sense to us. Sometimes what God wants us to do and what we want to do are not the same thing. But God's ways always work out better than our ways. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we've not received the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now, you see a little letter B right there. That's because it's a reference to the original Greek translation. This is the idea that these are the people who are enlightened. Now, here's the idea. The idea is that God's Spirit comes to live in us when we become Christians and His Spirit reveals things to us that people that don't have His Spirit can't understand. Primarily, God's thoughts themselves. Because God's Spirit knows God's thoughts just like your Spirit knows your thoughts. And because your Spirit knows your thoughts and God's Spirit knows His thoughts, when His Spirit lives inside of you, His Spirit can reveal to you what God is thinking. And that's one of our goals. That's how we find wisdom. We see this carrying on in verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, here's what this is saying. This is saying that, A spiritual person is different than a natural person. Natural is code in the Bible for a sinful person. You think about this, you're naturally good at sinning, right? I have a son that is uh, almost 21 months, almost two, and he's already figured out how to sin. He knows how to say no. The other day Dana said, where's your cup? And he looked at her and said, you go get it. Now, he doesn't speak very few words, but apparently he knows you go get it. Now, you think about how disrespectful that was. You think about how rebellious that was. You think about how selfish that was. He's already figured those things out at 21 months because he's naturally good at sinning, and so are you. And natural people or people who live in the natural, they can't understand what God is thinking but that a person who lives by the Spirit of God and has the Spirit of God living in them, God's Spirit can actually reveal certain things to you and teach you certain things. Hey, Carla, it's hot up in here. Amen. Y'all give it up for Carla. She's about to make it cool. I feel like I'm in hell teaching right now. Am I the only one? Is this like, okay, all right. I mean, if that don't want you to get saved, I don't know what will. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We don't tell God what we're thinking. God reveals to us what he is thinking, and that the crux of everything, that's what I want you to get out of today's lesson. Today's message is that what wisdom is, is understanding what God is thinking. In its simplest form. Wisdom is knowing what God's thinking and living accordingly, and that's it. Living your life according to what God is thinking. And when you're a Christian, you can do that because God's Spirit, who knows God's thoughts, lives within you and can reveal to you what is the mind of Christ, what is the mind of God and His thoughts. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, this is how important this is. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, 
making the best use of the time because the days are what? Evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, hear what this is saying. The opposite of God's will is the will of the world, and the problem with the world around us is it's evil. Now, you wouldn't think necessarily, you wouldn't say, well, these people I work with are evil, but the reality is when people are in opposition to God, that's exactly what that is. If they're not on board with what God's will is, then they're against God's will. And that's hard for a lot of Christians in America to believe. They think, well, there's people for God, there's people against God, and then there's a neutral group in the middle. But that's not how God looks at it. God says in Scripture, if you're not for me, then you're against me. That's it. End of the story. And so if you're not wise, then you're foolish. And if you're not wise, then you're against the will of God because the will of God is always wise. So let's talk about today 10 ways to live by wisdom according to the Scripture. Here's the first thing you got to do if you want to live by wisdom. You need to ask God for wisdom and understanding. You need to ask God for wisdom and understanding. Now, this is an important part of this. It is usually beneficial to ask God for wisdom before you make an important decision. Like, let's say, for instance, you were going to get married. I might ask God for wisdom before I was going to do that. Let's say you were going to take a job. I might ask for wisdom. Let's say you were going to move. I would ask God for wisdom before I made that decision. Dana and I, we've seen lots of people move to another place to take a job that paid more money. Didn't talk to anybody, didn't get any advice, didn't get any counsel, did not even ask God for wisdom, just made the decision and said, Lord, bless it not realizing they didn't have any support where they were going. They didn't have any family where they were going. They didn't have any friendships. They didn't have a church. They didn't have any of the spiritual things they needed to be successful where they were going. Got to the place, made more money, but watched their lives unravel. Because money isn't everything. If you've ever received a raise of more than $10,000, you understand just how quickly you can adjust to that money, can't you? I mean, I've gotten a raise before, and by the time I got the raise, I had already worked out spending all of it and felt just as broke as I was the day before I got the raise. The world is like this. People, it's, we're going to be in um, February, March soon. There's going to be people getting tax returns. A lot of people have spent their whole tax return in their mind before they get it. Some people are so anxious to spend it, you can actually get a tax return loan. Where you sign over your tax return to them, and they actually, you spend it, and they get a piece of it, because you couldn't even wait, like, three weeks. That's how long you got to wait for your tax return in this digital world. I can't wait that long. I need this money now. That's not always wisdom. If you're going to make any decision in life, you should seek God's wisdom. That's one of the ways you live by wisdom. James 1.5. If anybody lacks wisdom, what should they do? Ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man unstable in all their ways. So this literally says, if you need wisdom, who should you ask? God. Now think about all the people who ask. We'll ask our mom. We'll ask our friends. We'll ask our pastor. Do I want you to ask me? Yeah, I do. But I think you should ask God too. Hey God, would you give me wisdom to make this decision? It's a very simple prayer, but I'm blown away at how many people just don't pray it. And the reason I think a lot of people don't pray that prayer is because they're afraid God might say, no, don't go do that, and then that's going to mess their whole thing up. We'd much rather pray, Lord, just bless my will as opposed to show me yours. First thing you got to do is ask God for wisdom. God, is this a wise thing for me to do? But when you ask, have faith and don't doubt. Now, what's that mean? That means when God shows you what to do, do that. 
Don't doubt that what God showed you was the wise thing. Don't go, God, would you give me wisdom? And God says, don't do that. Don't go, no, no, God, you don't understand. Let me explain it to you again. <laughs> That's unstable. And it says that kind of person shouldn't expect to receive anything from God. Literally, God says, if that's how you're going to ask, don't think I'm going to answer because I won't. I'm not going to answer that prayer. Psalm 119, verse 27, make me understand the way of your precepts and I'll meditate on your wondrous works. This is actually a prayer that the psalmist is writing saying, Lord, would you give me wisdom? Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I'll answer you and I'll tell you the great and hidden things that you have not known. Here's what it's saying. If you just ask me, I'll give you wisdom. I'll reveal things to you. I'll show you the things that other people don't even know that are secret and hidden. Now, we just read in 1 Corinthians that the secret and hidden things are the wisdom of God. Proverbs 4, 6 and 7. Don't forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she'll guard you. Talking about wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. So what's the beginning of wisdom? Get it. How do you get it? By asking God for it. It's a simple prayer. Lord, I need to make a decision about what job I'm going to take. Would you give me wisdom? Lord, I need to decide, is this a relationship I should be in? Would you give me wisdom? Lord, I need to decide, what should I do? Would you give me wisdom? Now, sometimes God gives us wisdom. Sometimes we already know. We already know what to do. But we got to fear the Lord, which is my second part. This is you got to actually obey him. I had a guy come up to me one time. Him and his wife had seven kids together, but they weren't married. I thought it was his wife because they had seven kids together, and I figured, you're married, right? <laughs> and so he came to me, and he said, hey, I'm thinking about getting married. What you think? I said, brother. You got seven kids. Ain't nobody want you. <laughs> this ain't wisdom we need. This is fear in the Lord we need, right? Because here's what fear in the Lord means in a simple form. Fear in the Lord means obeying God. Obeying God. The word fear means respecting. To respect means to place someone in authority Fear in the Lord is simply obeying God. Proverbs 1, seven: the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And Matthew 7, Jesus gave an example of this. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Now let's establish something. What's the difference between the two people? They both heard the word, but one did what? Obeyed it. And he says the person who obeyed it is like the person who built their house on a rock. Now, what's the rock in this message? No, it's not. They both heard the word. And it's not Jesus. The rock is wisdom. Now, how do we know this? Because we just read earlier in this class as we're going through the scripture that Jesus said, by wisdom, I founded the earth. The foundation of the world is wisdom. If you want a solid foundation, you live your life on wisdom. The person who was wise was the person who heard the word and then obeyed it. That's fear in the Lord. Fear in the Lord is obedience. Obedience is brings wisdom. If you want to live by wisdom, you got to fear the Lord. Now, most people in the United States of America don't fear the Lord. That's because we got a New Testament God. In the Old Testament, you had people like Jehoram, Second Chronicles. Who disobeyed the Lord, didn't follow God, and the Bible says that God smote his bowels. And after two years of great agony, they fell out. And I shared this recently. Yeah, I don't know what that means. But what I'm saying is if you saw somebody disobey God and then their bowels fell out, you might be thinking, yeah, I'm probably not going to do that. 
That's why I don't mess around with the church money. Because you got New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira. They lied about how much they got for the property. So it says the Holy Spirit killed them. Now, I don't know all of the requirements. I don't know all the like little detail rules. I know what it takes to go to heaven, but there's some people, and I, eh, I don't know if they're going to make it or not, but I'm pretty sure if the Holy Spirit murked you, <laughs> you can't get in. Right? You can't be like, uh, yeah, I'm here for heaven. You know, we was just up in church, and they're going to say, didn't the Holy Spirit kill you? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can't be here. You're looking for the other line that's around the corner. Go down the steps. Here's the reality. The reality is fear in the Lord is nothing more than saying, you know what, I'm going to obey God. I just think about that story of Ananias and Sapphira. If there was anybody else that was supposed to give their financial report up next, if they was thinking about doing anything shady, they were like, no, 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 I'm going to give you exactly. I got $146.37 and one half cent for my property. Exactly. To fear the Lord means to obey him. It's just that simple. Now you think about the areas where it's hard to obey the Lord. You know what you're supposed to be doing. I don't need to beat that drum. Just got to pull the trigger and ride the bullet sometimes. And if you really feared the Lord, you would do it, and it would actually be a wise thing to do. And when you got wisdom, wisdom, what does it bring you? Blessing, long life, great riches, honor, peace, a pleasant life, sweet sleep. You holding yourself back. By being foolish and not obeying the Lord. Number three, I'm preaching to the choir right now. Keep an even temper. You got to keep an even temper. Proverbs 17, 27 to 28. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise when he closes his lips he is deemed intelligent. Think about what this is saying. One of the wisest things you can do is to stay cool. And one of the best ways to stay cool is to keep your mouth shut. And even if you're not keeping your cool, but you keep your mouth shut, you will be have perceived to have kept your cool. Ecclesiastes 10.12 the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. One of the best ways to live in wisdom is to keep your mouth shut. Don't say nothing. Now, when do you need to keep your mouth shut? When you feel like saying something. Am I the only person that's ever had that feeling? I'm fixing to say something. I've had enough. We fixing to have some words right now. Am I the only one here today? Okay, I'm just checking. All right. To be wise, you got to keep an even temper. That means you got to be cool. You got to be cool. Me and Dana, we got four kids. It's hard to keep you cool with four kids. I asked my son a few minutes ago when he got home from school, what you got on your science test? He said, 77. I said, why? Why? I'm like, all right, I'm going to keep my cool. Keep my cool. About 10 minutes later, he walked up. He said, uh, can I talk to you privately? <laughs> Listen to me. When an 11-year-old tells you he wants to talk to you privately, there's not some good information about to come out. He's not about to say, you remember that Powerball? I was one of the three. <laughs> That's not about to happen. He said, uh, he said, I did something real bad, and uh, you're going to want to ground me. And uh, just don't yell. <laughs> this, it happened right over here, exact conversation, in that corner of this room right here. He says, my math test. I said, what you got? He said, mm. <laughs> he said, well, it was only supposed to be the addition of fractions. But there was multiplication and division, and I wasn't prepared for that. And, uh, you know, they had 42 on there and took seven away. How am I supposed to give a fraction of that? 
don't even know what he's talking about. <laughs> like, what's And the whole time, all I'm thinking is, keep your cool, pastor. <laughs> He's about to preach on keeping an even temper in like 10 minutes. <laughs> keep your cool. But you got to remember, keeping your cool is wisdom. It's wisdom. Number four, to live in wisdom, you got to teach and worship the word of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, what do I mean by teach the word? Well, that's pretty simple, right? You share it with somebody else. Let me just, it doesn't need to look like this. You can teach the word to your children. You can teach the word to your people you work with. Tomorrow at work, you just say, hey, let's talk about wisdom. Hey, you got to keep your cool if you want to be wise. You can also sing the word of Christ. What does it mean to sing the word of Christ? Well, a lot of the songs we sing in church is nothing more than the word of God put into a song form. When you start singing it, it gets up in you. How many of you have ever found yourself singing a song you memorized that you didn't like? Right? I don't even like that song. I didn't want to listen to that song, but now I know that song. Because my kids like it, because they enjoy it, because they want to listen to it, because they want to repeat it, whatever it may be. Well, I know the whole Lil Einstein's theme song. I don't like that song. I don't even like that show. But when you start singing things, it starts kind of getting in your soul a little bit. That repetition, that's why it's important to worship. A lot of Christians don't know how to worship. What that does is ingrain in you wisdom. It don't matter what kind of worship songs it is. You can listen to gospel worship. You can listen to Christian hip-hop. You can listen to Spanish worship. You can listen to old school. Whatever you want to listen to. Just get that word of God singing in your soul. That gives you wisdom. It imparts that into you, and then it starts coming out of you when the time is right, when the moment is right. Number five, ask others to pray for you. Ask other people to pray for you. Ephesians 1, 16 through 19, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Ephesus, and he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of what? wisdom in the revelation of knowledge of him that having the eyes of your hearts enlightened you may know what the hope is to which he has called you what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what's the immeasurable greatness of the power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might now you think about this he's telling the church in Ephesus hey I'm praying for y'all to have wisdom one of the ways you live in wisdom is by asking other people to pray for you to have wisdom and you think about this hey I got to make a decision would you pray for me? Now, I'm the pastor. Should I have other people pray for me to have wisdom? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because wisdom is one of the ways that God speaks to us. We get the mind of God, the mind of Christ in us, and it reveals things to us. But sometimes we need other people to pray for us to kind of fan that flame within us. Hey, I make a decision. Pray for me to have wisdom. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask if all of y'all tonight before you go to bed, would pray for me to have wisdom. Would you do that? It don't need to be a long prayer. It doesn't need to be educated prayer. It doesn't need to be in the King James Version. There's a quick prayer. Hey, would you give the pastor wisdom? Because I sure could use it. We all need somebody praying for us to have wisdom. You at church, Sunday morning, we get to the end of the service. Hey, anybody need to come forward for prayer? If you need wisdom, what should you do? Y'all need to pray for me because I need wisdom. We act like prayer is for broken people with problems. But prayer is to keep you from being broken and having problems. It can be preventative if you would just ask for it. But a lot of times we don't get the prayer we need because we don't do what? We don't ask for it, right? We're like, I'm just going to figure this out and get credit for it on my own. Number six. Be cautious. 
be cautious. Proverbs 14, 16, one who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. Now, what does it mean to be cautious? Anybody got any thoughts? So a friend of mine is, uh, was moving back from California, and his car was shipped over here before him. So he said, hey, could you drive my car home for me if I get it dropped off to you and receive it because it got here earlier than he expected? I said, yeah, no problem. So he dropped the car off yesterday. So I drove his car to his house, and I dropped it off for him. Now, it's not my car, and it's, uh, his car is worth a lot more than my car. So how do you think I drove it? I drove it cautiously, right? Now, I text him after I got off, and I said, hey, look, man, I just want you to know I got that bad boy up to 80 miles an hour on River Road. And uh, he's a black guy. I told him I got pulled over, but because I'm white, they just gave me a warning. <laughs> and so this morning, he texted me back, and he said, uh, he said uh, hey, man, did you really get pulled over? And I said, nah, man, I ran them fools. <laughs> but the truth is, I actually drove cautiously. And, uh, you know, he said, he said, well, they had like a sport mode button. He said, if you'd have hit that, you definitely would have ran them. I said, look, brother, it took me 20 minutes to figure out how to turn the heaters off in the car. My booty was burning up. I was just kidding. No, you got to be cautious because being cautious is... Wise, right? It would have been a foolish thing for me to have driven any car out of control, but especially one that wasn't mine, and especially one I couldn't afford to replace. Okay, now if it would have been like a 1981 Datsun, I might have let loose on that bad boy. <laughs> Number seven, this is an important one when it comes to wisdom. Receive criticism. My wife's on the front row dying laughing right now. Because we have a weekly conversation about how I'm stubborn and hard-headed and don't know how to receive criticism. Right? Yes. Now, here's what it says. A rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows to a fool. Meaning one word of criticism is received better by a wise person than a hundred slugs to the face of a fool. You ever thought, man, that person going to need to hit rock bottom? There's some people that need to hit rock bottom 100 times in a row. Repeatedly get hit in the face by rock bottom. And they still don't get it. Still don't get it. There's some people, I counsel them, I talk to them, I share with them things, and I think, man, they finally got it. And then they say one more thing. And I realize we didn't make any progress at all. <laughs> Don't be that kind of person. A wise person can receive criticism. Now, here's the problem with criticism. Usually, when a person criticizes us, we judge the method of delivery and not the message of delivery. But usually, when the method is wrong, the message is still right. There's a little bit of truth in what they said, and if you just look for it and find it, boy, you become so much wiser for it. To live in wisdom, you've got to be able to receive criticism. Proverbs 12.1. I don't know that the Bible verse gets any clearer than this. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. If you can't take some criticism and correction, then you're stupid according to the Bible. That's what God said, not me. Number eight, realize that you have no wisdom. This is a hard one. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 20, let no one deceive himself. Now, who's doing the deceiving? Me, to who? Myself, right? If anyone amongst you thinks that he's wise in this age, let him become a fool that he might become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolish with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness, and again the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. 
Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable are His ways. Now, this is just a personal observation, having been a pastor for quite a few years. It concerns me any time a person thinks that their will and God's will are always the same. In all the people I know in the Bible and in my own life, I usually discover God's will when it's something I don't want to do. When God's will shows up, you are not usually like, oh, this is going to be awesome. You are usually like, God, I'll do anything but that. I'll do anything but that. Humans in this world are usually resistant to the wisdom, the will, and the ways of God. And the ways and the will of God usually don't make sense to us. We believe that the quickest way between two points is a straight line. But God is not in a hurry. He's not going for the quickest way. So a lot of times what happens is we see something happening and we go in this way and we think, oh, this is obviously God. We're going right here. I see where we're going, God. Good plan. Good idea. I'm on board. I'm following you. And right before we get to what we're going to do, God says, all right, turn left. And you're like, um, yeah, but God is right here. It's like two more steps and I'm there. And he goes, no, no, no. Turn left right here. So you're like, you sure, God? Yeah, turn left. So you turn left. Now you're heading away from where you thought you were going. He says, okay, take another left. And you're like, no, God, I don't think you understand. Like, we already established we're going over here. Why you want me to go this way? That's not where we talked about going. And then God says, okay, now turn right. And you're like, all right, God, if I just took two lefts, I'd be right back there. So you turn, I'm good with that. God's plan and God's will and God's ways don't make sense. They don't make sense. God, I don't understand why I had to go through this. I don't understand why we had to go this way. As though saying I don't understand is in some kind of way going to make God go, oh, you're right, I didn't realize that my bad... And all it takes is for a couple of times of you refusing to do things God's way and you start falling in some pits and some traps and some booby traps, some devils, some satans, some demons. But you start realizing what you thought made so much sense was a terrible idea. That wasn't a good plan at all. It looked like a good plan on the surface. But it really wasn't a good plan. I mean, you think about Jesus in the wilderness. He's being, he's fasted for 40 days, and the devil shows up to tempt Jesus. And what's the very first temptation? They may remember? He said, Why don't you, if you're the Son of God, turn these rocks into bread? Now, could Jesus have done that? Yes. Would that have been a good idea? On the surface, yeah, right? You hadn't eaten in 40 days. How many of y'all did the fast with us? You did seven days, and you was like, man, I wish I could turn anything into bread. <laughs> like, I would stab somebody for bread right now. Like, I know why they do this in jail. I know. I will shank somebody for a Hawaiian roll right here. <laughs> and don't let it be some bread with some glaze on it. That's called a donut. I'll fist fight somebody right here in the service for that. He said, man, just turn the stones into bread. Does that seem like a good strategy in the world's eyes? Yes, it does. But that's how the devil works. He said, this would be a great idea. We could do this and then this. The world would know you're God. You wouldn't be hungry anymore. It's a great idea. But he said, no. 
Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What was he quoting? Scripture. He was saying, no, 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 let me take you back to wisdom. Not what seems to make sense. Wisdom at its core is following God even when it doesn't make sense. That's when you really trust in God's wisdom. You know, that don't make complete sense to me, but I trust you, God, more than I trust myself. Number nine, grow up. Grow up. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned, I had wisdom like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now, how do children reason? Foolishly? Selfishly. Yes, this is how children reason. I ate two bites of chicken. I'm full. Now I'm ready for a snack. <laughs> That's how children reason, right? Spiritually, you shouldn't be reasoning like a child. You ever had an argument with a child? Isn't that a waste of time? And they will argue for hours. I said, my son with the grades. Finally said, look, man, I don't even know what to tell you no more. So he said, look, it was really the teacher's fault. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, well, we're going to have a meeting with this teacher. And I'm going to let you tell her that it's her fault. That you lazy. Because I know that's what the problem is. And the reason I know he's lazy at school it's because he's lazy at home. My 11-year-old, he don't even can't figure out how to put the trash out. Is it because he's just that inept? No, it's because he's what? He's lazy. And you know this because your kids are lazy too. <laughs> and he's like, hey, I got an idea. How about if I do stuff around the house, you'll give me money for it? I say, okay. He's like, I'm going to take the trash out right now, 25 bucks. <laughs> I'm like, shoot, huh? I don't even get paid that much an hour. You ain't. That's his reasoning, though, right? That's his, like, it makes sense to me. I remember when my cousin was a little girl, and, you know, that back when people wrote checks. Y'all remember that? They still got like three people that do that at Walmart, and I always get behind them in line, too. I don't know how that works out. And it's messed up, too, because they just put the check through and run it electronically. It's like, could you just use your debit card and save us a bunch of hours? Because we got to watch you longhand out the numbers, you know. $1,387.27, zero, zero, underscore 100, slash to the end. And then they write notes, groceries for January. Like it's Rouse's. You knew this was groceries, okay? There wasn't nothing else with this be. I don't even know what I'm talking about, y'all. I don't even know. I, I remember my, my, my cousin, you know, her mama said, well, I don't have enough money for that. And the cousin, my cousin said, well, just write a check for it. Right? That's the reasoning of a child, right? One of my friends, he's one of my closest friends. He went to college. Lasted like one semester, but was still at college. He wasn't in school, but he was at college. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, he was, like, at the college, in, like, the common area, at the cafeteria, but he wouldn't have no classes. <laughs> and that's what he told me. He said, I would just use my debit card, and when they told me it didn't go through, I figured I was out of money. That's the reasoning of a child, right? You can be 20 in a child, right? Got to grow up, got to get wise, got to say, you know, it's time for me to mature at some point in my life. You know how you know when you mature? When you own your decisions. That's how you know. Last one, seek wisdom above all else. This is the story of King Solomon asking God for anything he wanted. 2 Chronicles 1, 7 through 12. And that night God appeared to Solomon, he just became king. 
And he said to him, ask what I shall give you. He told Solomon, ask for anything you want. Ask for anything you want. Now, what would most people ask for? Money. That's not what Solomon asked for. Solomon said to God, you have shown great and steadfast love to David, my father. You may be king in his place. O Lord God, let your word to David, my father, be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people, for who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? God answered Solomon, because this was your heart, and you have not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may govern my people, over whom I may made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings who, had, who were before you, and none after you shall have likewise. He said, because you wanted wisdom, I'm going to give you everything else. If it was this important to God in the days of Solomon, don't you think it's this important to God today? Let me encourage you. In your prayer, stop asking God for money and for opportunity and for this and this possession and that car, and to win the Powerball, and to do this, and to stop asking God. Start asking God for wisdom. Because God will start revealing to you his mind, his thoughts, his will, and his ways. And that will be what brings blessing and favor, a long life, honor, riches, all the things you're seeking for, they come from having the mind of Christ. That's wisdom and seeking to know wisdom. Wisdom's powerful if you let it change. Amen?